We've done it. We did it. We got there. I'm sorry. Just down to this. <laughs> it's my laptop. It looks posh, doesn't it? And, 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 and very smart and relatively new. But for some reason, it didn't like us. So we apologise for being a couple of minutes late. But that is part and parcel of so many of these things that we're doing now. We're cobbling together the technology we've got in the uh, relative comfort of our own homes and trying to do our best. We apologise for being late. Yeah. Lucky my dad's it. not watching. <laughs> yeah, you'd never live it down. Yeah, I'd never live it down. My never dad hates it, it if I'm just a second late for anything. <laughs> anyway, I'm Chris Packham. And I'm Megan McCubbin. And we're going to be giving you a live lesson this afternoon entitled Form Function and, and the, the Smell, smell of, of Poo. poo. <laughs> because we quite like poo. It's very useful to us biologists mm. and we'll explain why a bit later on. Anyway, to kick off, a lot of people are out taking their exercise at the moment and they're going to some green spaces and there you can find evidence of wildlife without seeing the wildlife itself mm. and that can be very useful to us you mm. see because some animals are shy some of them are nocturnal they're not going to be there when you're looking for them some of them only pass through very infrequently but they can leave things behind now the obvious signs are things like footprints but sometimes mm. they leave bits of themselves they do one of the things they can leave are feathers and of course you don't need to see the bird if you can identify the feather any ideas for this one look it's pretty big it's as, uh, about as long as my forearm so it's a very large bird it's gray i found it context is always important i found it alongside a river it is of course a gray heron's feather so i didn't see the gray heron but i know that the gray heron was frequenting that area this is another feather I picked up actually just a few days ago when I was walking myself, taking my daily exercise, and I found this one in woodland. Any ideas? Well, the brown coloration could lend itself to a couple of different things. If you're thinking diurnal bird, you might be thinking buzzard. But if you were thinking nocturnal bird, you might be thinking tawny owl. And what you uh, might not be able to appreciate uh, on the uh, laptop here is that the edges of this feathers are very soft and velvety and that's typical of owl feathers because they are soft surfaced in order to keep their flight silent when they're gliding through the woodland pursuing small mammals and in fact that pattern is very characteristic to them. Now I wasn't out at night, I was out in the daytime but I know that out the previous night in that area was the tawny owl. It's about finding the evidence of their presence. Yeah, evidence of evidence their presence. Evidence of presence. And of course, it's yeah. not just um, it's not just birds; it's mammals too. Now, this is quite a tricky one because it just looks like a bit of stick that someone has got ready to put put on a bonfire. <laughs> um, you'll see that all of the bark has been removed from the stick. And if you hold it right forward like that, you can see there are gnaw marks there, and particularly at the end. Look, you see the way that that's been chewed there. There seems to be some quite large scalloping going on here and at the top. And that's because this piece of wood was chewed by a beaver. So it's chewed it down here um, so it can better handle it. So basically what it was doing was this. It was eating it like a sweet corn, chewing all of the bark off of this piece of wood. So this is what one might call a beaver stick. And if you look at the other end, you can see there's even more gnaw marks on there. Now, I didn't see the beaver. Beavers are one of those animals which are incredibly shy and of course in the UK they're relatively limited in their distribution there's been some reintroductions some have miraculously escaped into various waterways where they're doing quite well for themselves but actually seeing the beaver can be quite difficult so those are a couple of things that you can pick up but there's also something else we frequently find if we keep our eyes open when we're out in the countryside which there is something we can frequently find particularly at this time of year when we come out of winter and we go into spring we might be finding more of these lying around now, skulls are really important. They give us so much information. Now, about we didn't actually have skulls 500 million years ago. We would have had these primitive bony plates in amphibians. So 500 million years ago, we adapted and evolved skulls to what we see today. And of course, if you find one and you can pick it up, there's a lot of information you can gather from it. Not just about what type of animal it is, but you could look at the teeth and see what it might eat, its ecological function, its ecological purpose, um, and whether it's a carnivore or a prey animal. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the difference between the two. Um, here is the skull of a fox. Now foxes have eyes that are predominantly facing forward, and the reason for that is because they are of course formidable predators, and most predators have forward facing eyes so that they have tunnel vision on what they're looking for. They're looking for that piece of prey, um, they keep their eyes directly on it, they don't need to be looking elsewhere because the chances are they're the predator, they're not going to be predated on themselves. 
So they are looking at that prey item and keeping a straight bob. Whereas if you look at the skull of a prey species, this is the skull of a roe deer, a male roe deer, you can see that its eye sockets are on the side of its head. And that's because it needs 360 degree vision. So it can keep a constant eye around it. So when it's feeding, when it's most vulnerable, it's able to have a clear vision of its environment and therefore be more aware of any oncoming predators and oncoming threats. So that's one way to tell if the skull that you found belongs to a predator or um, a prey species. Another way is to look at the dentition, their teeth. Now, deers have very special dentition. I've got the lower jaw here. I'm going to start with the lower jaw. So at the bottom here, you can see these incisors. Now, these are used for tearing off bits of uh, vegetation, bits of twigs and plants that they then chew. They then have this gap here, and this is something you'll commonly see in different types of herbivores. It's called a diastema. And the purpose of this is to reposition the vegetation matter, the plant matter, so that it's better able to be chewed by the molars. And I'm going to show you the molars on the top jaw because I think they're particularly fascinating. There's six molars on each side of the road. Look how sharp they are. They're much sharper than our own molars. And that's because they need to grind down plant material, increase the surface area of that material so that then the nutrients is better absorbed when it's digested. Pretty special. Pretty smart thing, isn't it, mm. really? Nice skull, this one, as well. Nice skull. And you also, you can appreciate the little bit of the diastema there, as well. Mm -hmm. And notice, also, that there are no teeth on the top mm -hmm. jaw. They just have, a, like, a, a cartilaginous pad. So they're mm -hmm. pressing those teeth from the bottom jaw against this pad to try and sort of articulate so, it, as we call it. <laughs> call it. Okay, it's bit quite hard. It's a bit falling oh, apart, this one. The lower jaw is not, not yeah, in best no, shape. no, no, it's not the best shape. Hold on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press this. Oh, there we are. So we've got it like that, look. And there you can see, it's not broken off, this is not a broken skull, but that, that's, it, that's how it would have been in life. And so these lower incisors press the plant material against the cartilaginous mm. pad to snip it off. And then they pass it backwards and forwards through the rest of the mouth, as mm -hmm. you say, to grind it up. But the other thing that this skull has got, of course, are these antlers. Mm. Now, antlers are very interesting. The first thing to say about them is that they are made of bone. They're not horns, they're antlers. This is a horn, it's not from a UK species, this is a horn from an impala, it's an African antelope. There we are, there we have it at the back there. So the key thing you can see about the horn is that if you point it forward, Reese, it's hollow. Mm -hmm. And that's because on top of the skull, there would have been a bony core which goes up inside the horn. And this horn would have continued to grow throughout the course of the animal's life. This was retrieved from a dead animal. It's not shed every year. These, on the other hand, antlers, are regrown from these areas here, which we call peduncles. You can see those there? There's like a stem. And on those stems at the top is a, a growth point where an enormous amount of growth takes place in a short space of time because these antlers grow very, very quickly. They have to because the deer is investing a large amount of energy in them, but it only needs them for a short period of time. And that is, of course, when they're rutting. Only the males in deer species have these, with one exception. Reindeer. The reindeer. <laughs> Female reindeer have antlers. As far as I know, yeah, as far as I know, that is the only species that has mm. antlers. Not all female reindeers have them, but some of them do. And anyway, so they're growing these for that combat, which we call the rut. Now, you mustn't think of antlers as a weapon. Although they've got these sharp tines here, the purpose for the deer is not to gouge another deer and kill it. Because in any sort of fight like that, even if you killed your adversary, the likelihood is that you would be injured too. And you don't be injured going into the mating season. It's the most important time of the year for you. And also, those injuries could turn bad and you could end up dying as well. See, animals will do everything they can to avoid, avoid fighting to the death. I've got another antler here, which is one of those which has been shed. So this is broken off naturally at the end of the season. But what I can show you with this is how these things work. And that is that they are designed to be interlocking. The reason they have these spikes on them, which we call tines, is that the deer, when they're head down combating one another, they lock together like this, and then it becomes a game of push and shove. Push and shove. It's not about stab, it's about push and shove. And of course, this one has been shed naturally and it's not in such good condition. You see that? It's been chewed. And it's been chewed by something that wants the calcium from it. 
because calcium is quite a hard mineral to get in, in the wild. And lots of things, squirrels, rodents, deer will even chew their own antlers if they can to get some of that calcium back, of course. So in order to find a perfect antler, you need to pick them up pretty quickly after they've been shed. Extraordinary. And the thing about the, uh, the antler is that this bone here, although it's connected to the skull, is a very, very different material. This is very tough and very strong and very resilient and very flexible. This bone here is far more brittle. Um, it would easily snap. So if I were to take a hammer to this skull, I wouldn't do it because it's a precious possession. Um, if you hit the hammer on here, it would shatter. You'd have to really work hard to break an antler with a hammer. And I've just got one more antler to show you here. It's, it's impressive, got, this, this one. This one's good. This one's it's gorgeous. Big. <laughs> so this is another UK species, although it's non-native. The roe deer was a native deer species. This one actually belonged to a fallow deer. Fallow deer are one of six species we have in the UK, and four of them have been introduced here. But you can see on here that this one, although it has tines at the top, it's also got this large scalloped face here, which is what we call palmate. It's like the palm of your hand, so it's, we call it palmate. And again, in life, the uh, antler would have been fixed on the head of the deer like this, and it would have been down like that, and these tines would have been interlocking, and it's all about pushing and shoving. But what I like about this antler is that I recovered it very shortly after it was uh, dropped off in the autumn, and as a consequence of that, there's not a single chew mark on it. It's <laughs> pristine condition. It's my favourite antler. Oh dear. <laughs> hey, listen, we've got okay. to do the quiz. At we the did, top. We've we got to do, to do that. the quiz. So, we have a mystery object for you all. So, in the comments, please suggest to us what you think this could be. It's a pretty special one. Um, have a look at this. It's quite unusual. Have a look. I'm going to give you a bit of a clue. Look at the top of that there. These hair like structures up the top. Mm, slightly difficult. We'll come back to this at the end, so get in the comments, let us know what you think it could be, and we will reveal all in a minute. Yes, we will. We'll certainly reveal all in a minute, but it's time to move on to our um, poo. <laughs> I've got quite a collection of poo. When I finally pop my clogs, I'm going to leave it to Meg. Oh, great. <laughs> Just what you want. <laughs> yeah, so that's what she's going to inherit. I haven't got any, you know, very much money, so there's not much, but the poo's priceless. We've got some priceless poo. So we'll start with cool. your poo. Now, this is a good piece of poo because I actually did get this for you when you were very young. I bought mm. this home and I thought, I know, rather than a tacky souvenir at the airport, I'll bring something very valuable back for Meg and put it on her sideboard. But I was only five, and a five-year-old girl is not always interested in a big lump of poo. Now, however, I would be very happy, more than happy with a big lump of poo, particularly when it comes from an animal like this one. So this poo, obviously, you can have a look. It's very dry at the moment. It's dried out, and but it obviously belongs to a herbivore. You can see all that vegetation in there. It's the poo of a black rhino. It just looks amazing, doesn't yeah. it? It's been through a rhinoceros. This has been through a rhinoceros. One of the rare, well, unfortunately, because of poaching, mm. one of the rarest animals in Africa now. Our rhino populations have declined significantly because they're poached for their horn. Yeah. So it's precious poo. Very precious poo. But they do produce 50 pounds of the stuff every single Don't day. Don't try and devalue it by volume. <laughs> I'm not devaluing it. I'm just saying it's a lot of poo to produce, isn't it, in a day? 50 pounds of poo. But there you go. They do eat 100 pounds of vegetation a day, so it does make sense. <laughs> But they are, uh, poo is very important for rhinos, much more so than we actually realise. Now, we know that animals communicate through scent a lot, whether they excrete from their scent glands, whether they excrete through urine. If you walk your dog, you have to stop by a lamppost, every single lamppost, for at least 10 minutes for it to have a good sniff. Because, of course, they're getting valuable information about the other individuals in that territory, what sex they are, how old they could be. Are they fertile? Could they be, you know, a good partner? So you'll learn a lot of information. But... What we didn't realise was that rhino poo actually has a whole social system associated with it. Now, rhinos come to poo together in a communal um, area called a midden. Um, so all these adult rhinos, males and females, will come in, deposit their poos, uh, and they will also visit it to gather information about who is in the area. Um, the poo contains uh, volatile organic compounds, which are a mixture of chemicals that produce specific scents. And those scents are then... Um, kind of calculated and everything and you can f the rhinos can figure out exactly about the information of all the other rhinos in the area and it helps them breed more successfully so a whole social system in poop what about that how cool is that see quite often animals anoint their poo 
using anal glands and the secretions from them, mm. things like foxes and badgers, for instance. So the poo itself will have a smell based upon obviously what the animal's been eating. Um, mm. But they anoint that poo using their anal glands. But this is different. This has it? volatile compounds within in it, it, in it yeah. and that is where the difference lies, Yeah, what which is that? pretty cool. And I got that from the black rhino midden. It was quite fresh at the time. A little bit's gone missing at the top, actually. It's coming apart in my hand a little bit. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. no. Do you know how to preserve poo like this? You bound to want to know that, obviously. Because everyone watching this is going to start their own collection the minute we finish. <laughs> the key thing is you've got to dry it out. That's the first thing. If you leave it moist, then bacteria will be active. Um, anything which is already living in there, uh, invertebrate larvae. Of course, in Africa, loads of beetles get into the poo mm -hmm. and, and break it down. They're a very important part of the ecosystem there. So the first thing to do, um, well, I hate to say it, but kill the larvae off. Put the poo in the freezer. Freeze the poo. That gets rid of all of the big stuff. Then you've got to dry it out. And then if it's veg, you know, if it's a vegetarian piece of poo, herbivorous poo like this, which is basically just compacted dry grass, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to spray it with hairspray. Yeah. And a big piece of poo like this is going to take about half a can. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, we're joking. We're joking about poo here but it's really valuable stuff just like the feathers it can tell you mm. which animal's been there we go out in the woods every day we what find, do we see we badger poo all the time um we never see, see the badgers never see the badgers but we see their poo all of the time we see fox poo partly because our dog sid likes to roll around in it and bring it home which is mm. lovely thank you very much he's sid. dressing himself up in those he's, volatile chemicals he's dressing himself up he thinks it smells good but doesn't realize that you know it actually makes him quite unfavorable in mm. our household mm. but anyway um but lots of different things the feathers that we find there's just evidence everywhere you don't actually always have to see the animal sometimes seeing a feather or their droppings poo Horn skulls, anything is just as exciting as seeing the real thing because you know it's there yeah. and it's brilliant. And also, when you put it in the hands of scientists, they can get information from it. Mm -hmm. So, in the old days, I spent uh, five years breaking down badger poo to analyse the contents of it under a stereo microscope in the University of Southampton. These days, people will be able to take DNA samples mm -hmm. very affordably, and we'd be able to identify those badgers, if not to individual, but then certainly to parent cub groups uh, mm. using that DNA and that this is allowing us to census animals in the UK which are even more difficult to see than badgers, things like otters. Mm. So people go out, they collect the otter poo, um, they get a DNA test it and it tells them pretty accurately how many otters there are in that area. It's not 100% yet but it's pretty accurate and it's certainly going to be a lot easier than just sitting there and trying to count. Anyway, I've saved the best till last. This is um, I've got some sort of top poo in my collection, but this is this is um, a tricky piece, and it's another herbivore. Um, and look at that. So here it is. It's about the size of my palm. Um, it's about oh, I don't know, is it about that diameter? It's about the same diameter as a toilet roll. Paradoxically, <laughs> what about that? No, no. What I use toilet roll, like the cardboard, not yeah, like the, the whole cardboard, one. the roll. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, the roll. But it's um, big. It's, it's pretty, yeah. and it's got lots of vegetation in it. And uh, I'm just going to have a look to see if I can see more precisely what's in it. It's got a bit of leaf in there. It's got there. leaves. Lots of dried leaves. Lots of leaves, dried leaves, bits of seed, grass, all sorts of vegetation. So we know it's a herbivore. Um, and looking at the size of that, I can tell you it's not a UK native species. Mm. We don't have any of these types of animals at large in the UK naturally. Um, it's just a really tricky one because it's not a mammal. So it's not a mammal. So it's a large herbivorous animal producing a poo of this size, which is not a mammal. Well, we can rule out fish, of course, because their poo disintegrates in the water very quickly to collect that. I mean, I've tried, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's proved difficult. Um, and then it's not uh, an amphibian. There's no amphibians on the planet big enough. It's not a bird. Uh, you know, even there's no, well, no, birds don't produce poo of this nature. But poo is very, very different, as you know, if you've got a car and there's a poo on it. So it's a reptile. This is the poo. Oh yes, <laughs> of the giant tortoise. Now, oh, come on, don't tell me you don't want that on your mantelpiece. <laughs> giant tortoise poo. Oh, do you know what I found? That I've got about six bits of it. You've got six bits. Yeah, there's a bag over there with another. Oh, bag. You're a bit stingy with your giant tortoise poo, aren't you? <laughs> I have been oh. stingy. With my giant tortoise poo. What about that? What about that? Okay, uh, should we get off the poo and answer the, uh, the we quiz? We should. So let's okay. see if any uh, suggestions. If not, uh, if you haven't done yet done so, put suggestions in the comment now. What, what do you think? Of, mm. Not sure if I can see a shark fin. Um, what you're waving it about. Shark, so have a look. 
Hello, if you want to stick it. Uh, Owen's got it. Rachel Kubicki. It. Rachel Kubicki's got it. Yeah, she's got it. Well, oh, and also, Cossack has got it. Yes, so it, it might help if I start doing this. Larry. Tasha Underwood said, part of a whale's mouth. That is very. Excellent. Okay, let's tell people what it is based on, then we can so move this, on to the questions. This is the baleen whale uh, tooth, essentially, the tooth like where the teeth would be. So when you look inside a, uh, a whale's mouth, either it will be a toothed whale, it will have tiny teeth, and often they go down and they catch squid and things like that, or you have baleen whales, like a fin whale, which is the whale that this belongs to. Now, these whales have many of these plates in their mouth, somewhere between 262 and 435, I believe, um, depending on the whale and the size. But what you can see here is all these hair-like structures. So what happens when the whale is swimming? It opens its mouth because it has a massive gape. A fin whale can take in 70 cubic metres per gulp which is absolutely massive. And within that gulp, there is going to be a lot of krill. It's 70 huge. cubic metres. 70 cubic metres of water in one gulp. Impressive, isn't it? Mm. Well, they are the second largest whale, because you've got blue whales, and mm. then you have fin mm. whales. So absolutely huge. And within that water, you're going to have a density of krill. You're going to have copepods, which are small crustaceans. And you're also going to have small fish in there as well. But of course, that whale does not want to consume and digest all of that salty water, which wouldn't be very good for it. So it needs a way of expelling that water out and filtering the prey uh, from the water. So that's what these hair-like structures are for. So when it takes that big gulp, it's then able to push the water out through the gaps in these structures here, leaving the krill and everything inside the mouth, which is then able to digest. Pretty special stuff. Got a huge tongue, haven't they? Massive tongue. Massive tongue, which they use to squeeze all of that water out and then mm. put the, uh, the the food, which they've they've filtered essentially, in into their throat, be able to swallow. And what's the neatest thing about the whale's throat? Wow, you'd think that it was going to be really, really large. Now, that we always hear about, you know, what is the biggest thing that a blue whale could swallow or a fin whale could swallow? And everyone says, oh, a double-decker bus or something like that, which is not the case whatsoever. Their throat, the, the size of what they can actually swallow is tiny. It's about the size of a small melon. Yeah. So what they can actually swallow is this size. Compared to their massive gape, 70 cubic metres of water, they can actually only swallow some things that's this big. Yeah, so they have to squeeze all of that krill that they filtered through mm -hmm. their tiny, tiny throat into their stomach. Remarkable stuff, isn't it, really? All these bits and pieces. Yeah, I like bits and pieces. Yeah, bits good. and pieces. They're can, good, aren't they? It's like a puzzle, isn't it? You pick up bits and things and you work it all out and you figure out who's who, where they've come from and what they're up to. Yeah, and also it tells you so much about the animal's life, its behaviour, mm -hmm. its anatomy, all those sorts of things. Sometimes you can... Um, section parts of bones um fish have a tiny organ in their in their head and other animals have organs in their ears which they grow annual growth wings just mm. like a tree so if you recover those and you section them you can find out how long the animal was when it when it died mm. so all of these sorts of things can be useful not just for the, the nature table if you like because that's what we used to have when i was at school we used to have a nature table people would bring things in birds old birds nests and that sort of stuff but also, of course, in the hands of scientists, they can tell us a lot about those species. And the more we know about them, the better able to conserve them we are. And so many of our species now mm. need conserving, but we need to understand as much as possible. And that's why people go to university to learn more about it. And I think we ought to say something about going to university. Yes. Because, frankly, when I went, it was sensational. And I've had the great uh, privilege recently of working at Lincoln University, where their natural science department is equally sensational. It's always a joy to go there. You learn lots of new things. Um, there's always academics and the students too, I've got to say, pretty smart students who come up with uh, new discoveries. And it's that sort of thirst for knowledge and exercise and curiosity, which is, of course, driving science forward. And Lincoln's mm -hmm. a great university. Do you know what? It comes pretty close to the top when it comes to the student experience. People love going to that university. It's a fantastic town. There's all sorts of resources there. And as I say, if you're into natural sciences, it could be on your list. Think about going to have a look round at the centre stage. Should we answer a couple of questions? Let's answer a few questions. Let's have a look. Region. Yeah, let's see. Let's scroll through a little bit. Um, there was one 
question about there are kites circling around my garden. Why would that be? Well, firstly, they circle um, because they've got remarkable eyesight, and even from quite high altitude, they can look down at the ground and spot their prey or the things that they are scavenging. Now, when it comes to prey, with red kites in the UK, it could be everything from an earthworm to the size of a baby rabbit. Kites are large, they're large in size, but they're small in stature. They're actually quite a fragile bird of prey, so they're not what we call a formidable predator. They're not going to swoop down and catch rabbits or take on a fox or a, a cat or anything like that. They prefer to feed on things which are quite small, like small mammals, or scavenge from the roadsides. But the reason that they circle is that why they're circling over your garden. Well, it could be that you've got trees in your neighbour's garden or in yours too, and on warm days, trees are a source of generating thermals, columns of hot air. And the kites like to use these as they're able to soar on them without having to flap their wings and they'll move from thermal to thermal so it could be that other than that of course you, there's stuff in your garden which mm. they may want to scavenge i don't know what's lying around mm. in your garden <laughs> so one more question i'm assuming um sylvia bieber you're referring to these perhaps what is this made of it's made of keratin the same stuff that our fingernails is made of as well um really important structure very um very important. Lots of stuff is made from it. Yeah. It's continuously growing. All of that kind of Birds stuff. Birds, beaks, brilliant. yeah, all sorts of things in in the animal world. Keratin and its sort of similar uh, similar uh, you know, mm. compounds uh, are producing all sorts of uh, interesting things. Is that it, Bruce? No, well, there's one more. So this is from Seb, who is six years old. He says, "I love the T Rex program. A piece of my schoolwork is to design a leaflet about an invertebrate. What is your favourite invertebrate?" Difficult question. So many so great many. ones. Butterflies, mm -hmm. dragonflies, praying mantis. Ooh. You had a thing about praying mantis. I didn't love you? praying mantises. Yeah, mm. I had a, I had one in my bedroom as a kid. I absolutely loved them. Yeah, you liked that more than the fox pool. I mm. did. Yeah, mm. yeah. I was fascinated. <laughs> yeah. So praying mantis. Yeah, I mean, I prefer the predatory inverts. I don't know about mm. you. Definitely the predatory inverts. So in the UK, I would say probably dragonflies are my favourite. And the dragonfly season is starting, really. Some of the dragonflies will already be out now. Some of the damselflies are definitely already out. It reaches a peak in July and August when it's at its warmest. Um, but you'll see dragonflies. Uh, yeah, that's a good thing, Seb, for, for your leaflet. There's a good history. There were once dragonflies with wingspans of 30 centimetres. Yeah, prehistoric animals we're talking about now. Um, they're the only animal that we know when it's flying that can loop the loop. And some of the dragonflies that are living in the UK can fly at speeds of up to 30 miles an hour. So they could be speeding past your school. <laughs> if there were a policeman there with his speed gun, he could give a ticket to a dragonfly. So yeah, maybe maybe choose dragonflies. There's so much to learn about them. And they're equally, they're very, very beautiful. Stunning. Too. Absolutely stunning animals. Um, should we do... One. Yeah, go on then. So Isabella Pouncey, who's aged seven, we have bats in our garden. I would like to leave them some food. What's good to leave them? Well, UK bats mm. are insectivores. They like to eat lots of insects. So that means if you can plant lots of different things that are really valuable to those insects, then you'll get the bats coming in more and be able to support them as well. You can't feed them directly, can you? No. They basically they're eating small flying insects, moths, small beetles, or even things like mosquitoes mm. and midges. So you can't get those in a pet food store. So you, Megan's absolutely right. You've got to attract the insects to attract the bats. So that's it. Yeah, it's good. Is that it, Megs? Yes, I think. Uh, do robins come uh, only in winter? This is from Spencer, age six. Spencer, age six, robins. Both male and female robins have that red, actually orangey mm. breast. Yeah, they're very, very difficult to tell apart, a male and a female robin. Pretty much the only time of year you can really tell them apart is at this time of year because they, the female spends more time incubating the eggs. Mm -hmm. and she can sometimes get what we call brood patches on her breast. The, some of the feathers come away, so they look a bit raggedy on, on the front. And that will allow you to identify mm -hmm. them as females. You can't do it by song because they both sing. They do. Robins both yeah. they sing all the time. And they do. You can see them all year round, of course. So they will see them in the winter and then you'll see them in the spring. They are quite loud in the winter as well, aren't they? Yeah. They'll, they'll sing all the time. So Less um, birds singing then. Yeah, so they're more obvious then, I think, their song. Yeah, so robins, and, and so I suppose the other only other thing to part, answer that question, are they migratory? When you said, do they come? Um, they tend to stay on their territory all year round. 
So the robins you have in your garden in the winter will be the ones that you have there in the spring breeding. And that's mm. why they're singing in the winter, to protect that territory. There is some movement of robins, however, within Europe. So some of those Scandinavian robins, you know, it gets much colder in Norway and Sweden, um, they will come over to the UK. So we do get some visitors. And occasionally our robins will cross the channel and go to France and, mm. and northern Spain. But I think those records are quite infrequent. And they would probably only do that when we have very, very bad weather and we mm. don't get so much of that now. So mm. that's it. I don't know. I think what we can say. The word actually is sedentary. Sedentary. Spencer, wasn't it? So Spencer, the word is sedentary. Sedentary means it's an animal which stays where it is all of the time. So as opposed to migratory, sedentary, basically. Mm. Yeah. I'd like to end with one last question because I think it's a really poignant question, particularly at this time whilst we're all in isolation. Um, is exploring nature good for our mental health? Well, it's good for us. It's good for us. Um, I'd absolutely say that it's brilliant for health. You know, if you're having a bit of a down day, either into your garden or whether you have a window that you can look out of or go uh, exercise to your local green area, then I don't know, I find that it just kind of, for me personally, calms me down, it kind of regrounds me again, centres me up. Um, but we know that, of course, spending time in nature actually lowers our heart rate. It in helps our mental health so much that, in fact, it can aid our physical as well. So there's a lot of science being done on the effect of nature on our health and it shows a really important positive correlation that the more time we spend in nature, uh, actually the better our mental health and therefore the better our physical health can be. Yeah, particularly at this time, as you say, mm. the crisis is there. It's a terrible thing. A lot of people are finding solace and respite by engaging with nature. Ed says either in the garden or out the window or if you're taking your daily exercise on that walk. Mm. Try and find somewhere green to walk. It will make you feel better. You'll be calm and less anxious. Mm. It's just that... It's now being proved by good science, as you say. Mm. Okay, well, that's the end of our live lesson on this Wednesday afternoon. I'll tell you that next Wednesday afternoon, Jason Bradbury and Stuart Bibby will be giving a talk on the same platform, and the title of the talk is The New Norm Designs Adapt. Mm -hmm. Sounds that's intriguing, sounds intriguing, worth checking out. The talks on the uh, live lessons are you know, all different subjects. So there won't be, um, I, I doubt, I doubt it very, I mean, I'll be astonished if Jason or Stuart pop out with some of my tortoise poo next week. Hey, but they will have some stuff that we don't have. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. probably most people are going to want what they've got, not what we've got. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we hope you've enjoyed it and learned a little bit too. Do continue to engage with uh, University of Sessions Virtual Classroom in these live lessons. We'll see you yeah. again perhaps at some stage in the future. Thank you very much, everybody. Stay See you, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.